Uh, good morning. Such a joy to be here at Edmund Road Baptist Church for the first time for me. And when I see that 36 years, you know, over there, uh, that's when uh, we left back to India with my dad. I shared that uh, in the Sunday school. So I thank God for, you know, for his son Jesus Christ, first of all, for giving me that great and wonderful salvation freely. It's free, but it's not cheap. <laughs> and uh, the world is really drastically spiraling down to its doom. And then the Lord still has us on the earth here. So I thank God for giving me a privilege to serve him. And uh, it's just a privilege, you know, to serve the Lord. And I thank Brother Munson again for giving me this opportunity to come by. And, and uh, thank Brother Mandrino, Brother Bell, and the whole church, you know, for letting me come in and present our work, which the Lord is doing. And uh, uh, when I see your the picture of your church over there, the building, and this flag is right in the center, you know. Unfortunately, we can't fly our flag with that vigor and with that uh, pride. I think the only pride that goes behind that flag is the church building that is in the back. What I mean to say is the word in God we trust, which you have engraved in your, you know, the, your life, you know, the, this nation, the dollar, everything, you know. That's what makes this country a beautiful and most uh, greatest nation on the earth. Uh, it's not because of anything else. Uh, it's because of this book that you have published, you know, and then you've taken the gospel out, sending out millions of dollars, you know, many of your missionaries going out and, you know, some of them died on the field, you know. I mean, it's just great, you know. I just I love this nation. is because of that, you know. And then uh, I want to thank God again for this opportunity he's given me. Uh, before I go into the message, I'd like to have my girls come over we usually kind of try to, and I want to thank Jonathan, brother Munson's son, for letting me use his guitar, okay, wherever you are. <laughs> We, you've seen in the in the video or in the PowerPoint that India is a uh, is a big nation which has about uh, actually 2,500 2, languages and dialects together. I mean, it's the most confused country in the whole world. <laughs> and uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, and I would say usually uh, that most people from the Tower of Babel walk straight to India. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, that's because it has so many languages. And uh, imagine all the confusion. The moment you cross the border to another state, it's a different language. So the government has really uh, you know, brought it down to 22 major languages. And these are major languages. They don't look like, you know, they don't sound like each other except for a few words like the European languages. But still, it's, they're all different languages. So we are in a place uh, called uh, Telugu language speaking states. And then, uh, so the Lord is using us among those people. And uh, so India has many languages, and the one which we speak in our ministry is called Telugu, not Telhu. <laughs> like somebody asked me when I was a kid here in America, and they said, say, man, speak some Indian, you know, in school, you know. I said, there's no such a thing as Indian, you know. There's so many languages. So, all right, what do you speak? And I said, Telugu. Telhu? He said, <laughs> well, it's Telugu. And uh, the national language is called Hindi. So if you know that language, you pretty much, can, pretty much can make it anywhere in India. It's called Hindi. So what we do usually is to tingle the American ear a little bit, because you hear only English most of the times, or Spanish or the European. So we'll try to tingle you with some of our languages. So what we do is we sing a couple of choruses uh, in English, so that you would know what we're singing, and we're not speaking in tongues. <laughs> and uh, uh, you would be knowing these choruses. So first one we'll be singing in the native the, the, our uh, local tongue called Telugu, English and Telugu. And then another song, a chorus, which is from Psalm 63.3, and you would be knowing that too. And then that would be in Hindi. You might not be able to make out the difference, but uh, I'm telling you they are different. <laughs> and the last one we'll sing is from Psalm 27, for we like to sing that all the time. I think he put the key down a bit. <laughs> His love.
Thy loving kindness is better than love. Thy loving kindness is better than love. And it shall praise thee as well I praise thee. Thy loving kindness is better than love. Jeevan se biyatam tere karna. I'm so thrilled to be meeting some wonderful folk uh, who've seen me like a long time ago. And uh, when I put this on, I was remembering Brother Tiger Pettyjohn. And uh, in his church, he put me one of these, and I said, I look like Mr. Spock. <laughs> that was one of those, it never got to me. I'm never the sci-fi guy, you know. Uh, I never watched the Star Wars like my brother used to. But uh, that was not something that I caught, but I felt like Mr. Spock. So <laughs> I remembered him, and I'm pleased to meet uh, their mother and father here. So it's just I'm so thrilled to be here again. I'm rejoicing every moment of uh, the wonderful singing and, you know, everybody's presence and the fellowship here. So I want to thank God again for this wonderful privilege. I want us to go this morning uh, to a portion of Scripture. I'm using this uh, in my deputation to say what I would like to say and, you know, and it kind of covers everything that I would want to say. In 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, uh, from 14 to 21, I will be kind of a hop, skip, and jump kind of a uh, way I'll be going over it. I'm sure you must have heard it so many times, messages from God o o over this passage. But uh, I'd like to bring what we are doing over in India uh, using this passage of scriptures. So first... Uh, I, go, I want to go to, uh, go to 14th verse. For the love of Christ constraineth us. I want us to look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day you gave us. Where we could come to your sanctuary, to your presence, around your word, and be gathered in, Lord, to behold your beauty. And to know your love, that you loved for us, to us, and uh, the, the kind of love you showed to us. That while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. Lord, we thank you for that great love that you showed us on the cross. And Lord, sending your only Son, Jesus Christ. And we commit this portion of Scripture into your loving hands, Lord, because you are that heavenly manna, and you are that bread which is broken from heaven that you might give it to each one of our needs here, that anybody is here today, this morning, that your grace has abounded to this extent, to this day, to this moment, that they might come to know you as, your personal, as their personal Savior and to be reconciled to you, Lord, which is the most important thing in man's life. Lord, we commit this portion of Scripture into your loving hands. Thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you for the pastor. Thank you for the people here. We pray that you would bless this church and bless this portion of Scripture and hide me behind your cross and speak to me and to each one of us, Lord, and commit it into your loving hands. And pray this prayer in the most precious name of our Lord and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
for the love of Christ constraineth us. Now the word love is a uh, infinitely, you know, usable word, preachable word. You can preach on it all your life, still you can't exhaust it. And uh, but the Bible says, you know, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. The, the words that every Christian should be knowing it. And uh, the little two-letter word there, for God so loved the world, it has two meanings. Uh, that is what kind of love and how much of love. What kind of love, you can see it uh, being supported in 1 John 3rd chapter, first verse, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Because Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil. God did create us in his image, but Satan abducted us, you know, kidnapped us in the Garden of Eden, and we grew in, in, under his guidance and his fatherhood, you know. So he, we got all the traits from him. Because Jesus says, you know, he's your father, and you know, he's a liar, he's a cheat, and you do exactly what he does. So we grew under him. But you know, gee, God gave us uh, the promise right there in the Genesis 3.15. As soon as man fell, God didn't look any, any, elsewhere and you know, he didn't think over years and then come down with the promise. No. He said, thy seed and her seed shall have enmity. That's the seed of the serpent, which we are. You know, your generation of vipers, your generation of cyber, serpents, poison of asps is under your tongues. Man only speaks evil, you know. He thinks evil. There is none righteous. No, not one. There might be little good. People are trying to reverse that concept saying, well, actually you're good. Once in a while you do bad. No, actually you're very bad. Maybe once in a while you might do what you think it might be good. But not what God thinks it's good. But so, for God so loved the world, it says that so is so uh, kind of love, that manner of love is that he could make us back to his sonship through Jesus Christ. As many as received him to them gave him power to become the sons of God. So we become his sons again through Jesus Christ. Joint heirs, like in Romans 17. What a privilege it is. And then it says, for God so loved the world, the word also so means how much. Because in Ephesians 4 chapter, if you see that, we need to comprehend the height, the length, the breadth, and the depth of God's love. That's how much God loved us. Because God's love is not in the area. You know, the area of this in mathematics would be Length times breadth times height. But God loves us in volume. You know, there's depth. He came to seek and save that which is lost anywhere in the world. From him. Nothing can be here. He's an awesome God. And uh, that's the love we are talking about. So, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Now this, Christ loved us, you know. He said, uh, greater, hath, greater love hath no man than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. So Christ loved us, you know. And he says, you know, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself, or love one another as I have loved you. The way he loved us is, he, when he prayed to the Lord, the last prayer before he went to the cross, Lord, if it is thy will, remove this cup from me. But not my will, but thine will be done. And that's the kind of love Jesus, he took that cross for you and me, because that's the only way mankind can attain salvation. Not through works in any religion, not even Christian religion. I was sharing with a brother. Christianity is also a religion. You know that? It's not that religion that takes us to heaven. The Bible has only in one place the word religion in James. You know, pure religion and undefiled is to visit the fatherless and the widows, you know. But just by visiting the fatherless and widows or making any kind of a charitable institution does not take you to heaven. It's by faith and grace only. Not of works. So religion does not take us to heaven. Any religion. And the most dangerous is the Christian religion. Because it's hard to get to heaven if you're born in a Christian religion. So, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Christ loved us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a beautiful statement that is, you know. And uh, as Paul says, you know, every one of us should come to that statement that Christ Jesus came into this world, 1 Timothy 1.15, to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And that's the way it begins. You know, salvation begins with me. I am the biggest sinner in this whole world. The greatest, you know, people want to be great today, you know. I, be, I tell our young people, it is a skill to be not famous these days. You do any crazy thing out there, they bring the cameras, you know. You're on TV and you're famous. It's a skill to be not famous these days. And I tried my best to do that. Because there's not a big thing, you know, to be, being famous. And then people start hiding from the cameras, and, you know, paparazzi and all these things. Well, there's, why are you all after me, you know, after my life? Well, you wanted it. Then you don't want it now. What do you want then, you know? 
So that's the kind of world we are living in. So Christ, the love of Christ constraineth us. So the love he showed towards us, and then our love towards him. The little two-letter word of has a preposition, has a lot of meanings, you know. So the love of Christ constraineth us. So it does constrain us in a way, you know, to serve the Lord. Because the way he loved us. So I'll jump over to 15. Uh, because Brother Munson was very courteous and he did not tell what time I should finish. And, uh, and, uh, and your church doesn't have a clock there. So you didn't, uh, if I go over the time, you know, you just kind of raise some flags or raise your hand. But I, 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 I can shoot from my gun belt, from my holster, from my rifle. I can take out the shotgun too. Because I grew up in Texas, remember that. And everybody has a gun. And I like Oklahoma too, because you're right next to Texas. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so uh, it says here in 15th verse, that he died for all. Now I'm going to go back, uh, uh, bring some, you know, reminisce some things. Uh, when my dad was in IBC, and you know, I was a kid, you know, watching football and doing things and like that, my ears were always open to these big people, what they were talking, you know. Uh, the, his, uh, you know, classmates, and they used to come to our house, and, you know, Frankie Jones and Larry Jones, and, you know, all these guys, they used to come to my house, and I like those guys, you know, the company, you know, because the Bible says, the Lord gave the word, and great was the company of those that published it, you know. I always like to hear what they're saying. And they always used to say, well, are you a five-point Calvinist? Are you a three-point Calvinist, two-point Calvinist? I didn't know anything about that back in those days. I knew what Calvinism was. I was a kid, you know, 12 years old, three years, 13 years old. But I used to listen to that, you know. But here, when I come back to the Bible, it says that Christ died for all. Well, at, my t at the time of my ordination, my pastor asked me, are you a Calvinist? I said, I'm a Biblicist. Because that's what the Bible says. If, it, if, if everybody, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If all have sinned, and Christ came to die for sinners, then it says Christ died for all. There's no such a thing that he died for a few. That is a heresy. It's blasphemy against the gospel. I don't know how Baptists also got tainted with that. And God has given me this voice to speak up today. After so many years, you know, after hearing great men of God in IBC, and you know, I've been around the dear Moors and wonderful people, but I will go ahead and say, because I get the, uh, the, the, the courage from the word of God. Not anybody else. Because there are so many people out there. I was up in Canada doing some studying there because I couldn't come into the States at that time. And then I was at Toronto Baptist Seminary. I was doing my Hebrew and Greek and all those things. I wrote to Brother Dotson over in IBC. I asked him, Brother, can, I, can you give me something at third year level? He said, no, I can't give you, you know, and you need to look elsewhere. That's unfortunate. I would say that about IBC. But uh, I was over there, and then that's a purely Calvinistic college. I didn't know that. And then the, as soon as I stepped in, there was this young fe fellow on the com computer, and he asked me, uh, Rufus, have you ever read the Institutes? And I went and looked at the Institutes are such a big volume. I said, I don't have the time to read those. But one thing I'll tell you, if a man didn't understand what baptism is all about, what good those Institutes would do for, to me, I, tell, I told him. If he didn't understand ba scriptural baptism, all his life, I don't need to hear to uh, listen to him about the predestination doctrine. I'd rather go to the Bible. And it says here that he died for all. And I did not confer with Brother Munson what he believes about that, but I'm going ahead and saying it anyway. I hope he supports me and I believe that he would, because the Bible says so. Because that's what this church stands for, the Bible, isn't it? So it says for that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Over at uh, Roger's conference, there was a preacher who preached the first message, Brother Bert Atkins, and there was a wonderful way he brought it up, and uh, we are living in the generation of the selfie. It says that they should not henceforth live unto themselves. That four-letter word, my dad used a lot of uh, these little bitty uh, tips kind of uh, messages, you know. So I usually steal from him. The word, the four-letter word self uh, can be uh, demonstrated with one-letter word, which is called I. And that one letter I is the central letter of the word sin. If you remove that word, uh, that letter I, and uh, make it a zero or an O, like how the Lord, when Philippians 2, 5, it says, Though he was God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but has made himself to be of no reputation. 
today people want reputation isn't it even men of god you know unfortunately you know there is that instigation within us you know the system we want to be big everybody builds their ministries on their names i don't think that's biblical you know i don't mind mentioning names also you know it can be billy graham evangelistic association it can be john hagee ministries whatever what happens what happens when they die that's why jesus said upon this rock i will build my church he didn't build it on any man we are only vessels to serve him in his church through his church under his church that's why church is so important that's why satan has made another doctrine called the universal church so people kind of you know thrive in that but, but the bible doesn't support that at all they might be preaching great messages taking from spurgeon's uh, commentaries and all this these are all great men of god baptists they were you know they take messages from that and come out with a great message and take the name for themselves oh he is a great preacher you know here it says that they should not live unto themselves now that's a challenge folks the biggest challenge for us is ourselves denying ourselves if any man want to follow me or come after me let him deny himself i like luke how he puts it daily he says daily and follow me otherwise you are not his disciple we are not his disciple so our biggest enemy is our own self the heart is deceitful above all things how many of us have a heart we all have so our own enemy is our own heart we don't have to look at anybody else so when we look at them in the mirror it tells us that we are our own enemy cuz uh, the bible says so so you should not live unto themselves but look at this for unto him which died for them and rose again if christ did not rise again our faith is vain i wouldn't be here you wouldn't be here we don't need to be here you wouldn't even know god like everybody mentions the name god unfortunately today only way you hear it on tv or oh my god oh my god that's all they say what do they know about god how much do they know about that god they're mentioning they're using it in in vain but here we say he died for them and rose again how many of us are willing to die for the lord how many of us are willing to deny ourselves for the lord that's a challenging thing folks we can live all our life for ourselves so when we stand in front of god and says how much did you live for me well you had it all on the earth so that's that suffices it but that's not what god wants us to have but says he died for all them and rose again christ died for our sins and rose again he's a living god he's not a god of the dead he's the only way to heaven not one of the ways so that's one thing i wanted to mention and then i'll jump to 17 we all know that therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature what a wonderful statement that is the old creation was you know ruined by satan but god didn't you know like how we you know back in those days when we uh, use the typewriters you know something goes wrong he just <laughs> that noise comes you know and throw away that paper god didn't do that with us he prepared a plan for us to restore ourselves us to himself that's the kind of god we are talking about that's the kind of god we believe and that's the kind of god whose word we are reading and being admonished with so if any man be in christ he is a new creature we can go on and on but the old things are passed away behold all things are become new you know till we leave this earth or till the lord comes we are facing this every day changing you know towards the better towards the lord you know so all things have become new and then i want us to go these are the three main verses i wanted to to bring three challenging uh, uh invitations from and all things are of god the bible declares that in the beginning god there's no dispute if you dispute dispute it you're disputing yourself so the people the smarter they get in this world today they end up thinking that they came from a monkey how pathetic it is they can't believe the very three words of the first the first three verses of word of the bible you know in the beginning god i mean how much ever wise they get in this world you know when it comes to the concept of god you saw in my video indians have reached almost mars you know they are in on par with all these nations who are on the mars mission but when it comes to god that's why i put that slide right there they don't know about god they resort you know their bro one, one brother asked me about temples in america i'm i'm warning you folks my dad when he was doing deputation i remember him saying eastern cults are creeping into the west well they're already here now 
and their temples in America. This beautiful land which God gave. By the way, Columbus was coming to India. How many of us know that? I think everybody knows it. If Columbus really came to India, you guys wouldn't have been here. You would have all been in, in India. But I think that wasn't God's will. Because this nation was built on the foundation of the word of God. And God gave a beautiful nation. And then from there here, you could send the word of God to so many nations. But it says, all things are of God. How pathetic today, people don't de de believe God. Imagine denying the very existence of God is the most pathetic condition a man can get. Because the Bible says in Psalm 14.1, a fool says there's no God. Would you st talk to a fool? If you knew some guy is so foolish he talks, you know, you would always kind of avert him and go away. But that's what God does. You know, God cannot talk to a fool. If you want to be wise, we have to believe every word of the Bible. In the beginning, God. But which God? Who God? You know, who is that God? To the unknown God? Because people don't know God. Somebody has to go and tell them about God. That Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. Uh, no man can come to the Father who is in heaven but by me. There's no other way than Jesus Christ. So all things are of God. Everything what is given, beautiful, beautiful property. You know, Enven Road. I enjoyed it this morning. I went for a walk. It's God's. What we are wearing, what we are breathing is, God, is from God. The air that we breathe. And people use the same air and revile God that he's not there. Just because you never saw your great-great-grandfather doesn't does it mean he never, never existed? It's as simple as that. They're so foolish, you know, to deny God. And l l let's go, go, go to the scriptures here. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ? You have heard many times, I know that. But it's good to go through this again, go over this. It's all about God reconciling us back to himself. God is not worried about if it's raining in West Texas or not. Oh, people are dying of hunger. Yeah, it is all the causes of sin. Mankind has brought on to himself. God never wanted Adam to till the ground, actually. He had everything ready. Once he sinned, okay, boy, you're going to till it now. That's what he said. Otherwise, we would have been eating the fruit and enjoying. We didn't even need clothes. Today we need to have clothes. You know, we don't wear the same clothes again. Because we are living in not just covering days, we are living in fashion days. Clothing is fashion, not just covering your nakedness. See how we are going down. Uh, I'm watching the time. It says, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So it's all about reconciliation. God wants to reconcile man to himself. Because it's ultimately, that's what's going to happen. It is appointed unto man wants to die. Because the wages of sin is death. Everybody is going to die one day. If you know that you're going to die, you better believe the Bible. Because the Bible is what declares it. No other religion declares that. For the wages of sin is death. And it is appointed unto man wants to die. Why? Because he said, if you eat that fruit, you shall die. It's appointed by God that you will die. But after this, the judgment. Today people don't believe that there is a spirit. We are just body and soul, you know, breath, that's all. We are just like the animals, they believe. Well, they believe like that, but God didn't make us like that. God created an, us in his own image. The Bible says, if you degrade yourself and equate yourself, well, I'm like an animal too. Well, you are behaving like one, that's why you think you're an animal. That's the kind of world we're living in. But here it says, that uh, he hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. So God wants us to be reconciled to him. That's why the, uh, there's a challenge in 21st verse, sorry, 20th verse. In the middle it says, As though God did beseech you by us, this morning if anybody is here, I think that most of you are saved. But you know, you never know. If anyone is here this morning who has not been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, his grace is abounded till today, this moment. That you might hear it and be reconciled to God. And says, be reconciled to God. That's what it's all about. And look at this. In, uh, we'll go back to 18th verse. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. What a challenging thing. What a responsible thing. It's a responsible 
ministry, folks. We can't take it lightly. One brother just now said it. So he has given to us, you know. You know, if I had a, a Ferrari, I'll relate cars, okay? <laughs> because I like Lamborghini or, you know. I wouldn't let my girls have it because they have to graduate to a level of understanding of what's a Lamborghini, what's a Corvette, you know, how they should open the door, how they should softly jam the door, you know, how they should start it, you know, put themselves. I want it all. Then they'll say, well, here's the key. Now be careful. I'm going to give it to you. Now when I go to India, I'll call them and say, how's my car? But Jesus gave to his church the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Not representing the Republican Party or, you know, over in Washington. Because whoever might be there, Jesus is still king. And he's the Lord of Lords. Because all these earthly kingdoms are passing away. Big, huge kingdoms like the G Egyptian Empire kingdom, the Babylonian Empire, the, you know, the uh, uh, Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. The Persian Empire, they all passed away. Huge empires, you know, you couldn't go against the king. He would kill you, simple. But the kingdom of Lord Jesus Christ is coming. That's the only question when Pilate asked, he answered. Are you really the king? You said, yeah, I'm. he washed his hands. He shook in his pants. We better do too. And look at this. It says, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I need, I need to be reconciled to God. I need to bring others to reconciliation to God. That's the reason this church exists. Otherwise, we don't need to be here. There's no need for a church. Because the, the heart of a church is missions. Beginning from here, you're Jerusalem, to the uttermost parts of the earth, which you're doing. So he has, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So if anybody's not reconciled here today, today is the day, not tomorrow. Amen. Tomorrow never comes. You've never seen tomorrow. Today is the day, and now is the time of salvation, the Bible says. And let's go on to 19th verse. To wit that God was in Christ, which means Christ is God. Not just Jesus had the Christ consciousness, like Oprah Winfrey says. I heard that Oprah Winfrey's, Oprah is actually Orpah. Well, she really thinks like Orpah, I think. She should revert back to that name, you know. So she said one day that, well, Jesus is not really God. He just embodied the Christ consciousness. Woo! Let's get back to the scriptures. To wit that God was in Christ. Remember when Jesus was born, he was given another name too. 23rd verse of Matthew 1 says, His name shall be called Emmanuel. You'll find it in Isaiah. Same words. God with us. Muslims don't believe that Jesus is God. If they can just go to their Injil, which is one of their books they have from the four uh, Gospels, which Muhammad has corrupted them in their book, just tell them to stay, go back to that verse. They still have it. That Jesus is God. We can show it to them. It says Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That's the ministry we are involved in. You here and we there. Or anywhere in the world. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's a wonderful phrase. But I don't think I have the time to go into them. We all know what it means. Abraham believed God. And it was imputed to him for righteousness sake. You know, So our iniquity is gone in Jesus Christ. And his righteousness is imputed to us. We are not righteous at all, by any means. But it's only because of His righteousness, we are counted righteous. That's why we are eligible to go to heaven. Because of Jesus Christ and His righteousness. So, it says they are not, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Look at this. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Just before I came, I was listening to Charles Stanley. Uh, he does preach pretty good. He was talking about the word of God. And all the verses he was mentioning was from the King James Bible. But when he was reading, he was reading from the NASB. What are you doing? You might be a great preacher. But you better believe the word of God first. I believe in a King James Bible, folks. Because this book came through bloodshed. People died. They were not having the luxury of just going to Bible colleges and, you know, sitting on a nice table and, you know, having com committees and things like that. This book came because there was a man called William Tyndale who gave his life for that. And the king of England, he said, I'm going to have this book translated so that everybody would have the Bible and they would be able to read it. So it says here that he had committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
How do we get the Bible in our hands today? I'm going to say a couple of words from that on that and finish up. Churches have been copying them and tra- tra- you know transferring them. That's why the text behind the King James Bible is called the received text. It has been passed on from churches to churches, churches to churches, till today we have it in our hands today. People say, great preachers, they say, well, the Bible says so and so, but I'm going to ask them, take out your Bible and show me, do you have Matthew 1.25? For example, the NIV, most people use that. She knew her not till she brought, brought forth her firstborn son. How many of us think the word firstborn is important? Because it says in Greek, prototokos. Well, it's not there in the NIV. Because Jesus said, you know, when Satan is tempting us, by the way, God gave the word, but the devil made it an issue. Today, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm listening to preachers, you know, th- there's no issue anymore. They've already decided their, which side they're on. Either they believe this, or they believe that, oh, it's just a translation. I can go for any other version. It's all the same. Or, you know, they have majority text that's supporting them, so I'd rather take there. I'm not saying they're not saved. They love the Lord. I've been among them in Toronto Baptist Seminary. But we need to decide on the Bible because that is the basis of our faith and practice. Because we need to believe, Jesus said to Satan, you know, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The word theos is mentioned in the Greek. If you go to an NIV, it won't be there. Matthew 6, 33. Now I'm going to give you verses, you know. Matthew 18, 11. The entire verse won't be there. I'm going to call one of those beautiful children who came and gave so generously to, to the children's uh, home there. Uh, Brother Larry Jones is doing that ministry. I can call one of those and ask them. Matthew 18, 11. If you take an NIV Bible, you'll have 10 and 12. I don't need a scholar to tell me what comes after 10. <laughs> Your little kid can tell him. So we don't have to go into that biblical issue, you know. I'm into translation work, so I have to go into it. I have to swim the whole, you know, tide, go to the other and say, I'm here. What is this whole thing about? I studied my Hebrew and Greek under critical text people, critical text scholars, critical, critical text uh, uh, professors. My Hebrew professor said, I asked him, so bro, Dr. Gentry, which Bible in the English do you use? You know what he said? There are some prominent statements from people we remember for our life, like the one in Titanic. Even God cannot sink it. That's the only statement I remember. And then the captain comes into the, onto the deck and says, Oh my God. Who remains in the end? He's the beginning and the end. The Alpha and the Omega. The whole earth is going to pass away. But he's going to remain. His word will remain. So that's what we're seeing here. So uh, when I was there, uh, I asked my professor and he said, I asked him, which English Bible do you really say this is the word of God? He said, none of them would do any good to me, he said. Ooh. I said, all your academic excellence has been just washed down the drain. Because it doesn't matter if you have all the excellent knowledge, whether it's very good. But if you don't have or stand on the word of God, then it's very dangerous. So here it says, that he had committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now remember, this is to the church at Corinth. He's not writing it to any Bible society. He did not give it, commit it to any Bible society. We make them. But it is to the church, church you know, the local churches. When he wrote to Coloss- Col- the church at Colossae, he said, have it to be read in the church at Laodicea also. What I'm saying is, we need to stand on the Bible. The church is here. I know in America, a lot of churches are kind of shaky on the biblical issue. But it's the, it's the devil who made it an issue. God didn't make it an issue. He gave the word to us. And we need to publish it. This book has endured 400 years, folks. Billy Graham preached from the same thing. Church, it's, 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 it's Spurgeon's pre- pre- preached from the same book. So don't we drift from this book. It's a blessed book. Which gives us a blessed hope. And it is a blessed book indeed. So he says he has committed to us. Not for us to change it. Because if you take this uh, book and say, well, the Bible says like this, I'm going to ask anybody, you know, Robert Jeffress, the great preachers, First Baptist Church, Dallas, or whoever. He's not preaching from the King James. But he quotes all of them from the King James. How come you're doing that? Because you, were, you grew up on that. 
That's the Bible you sucked as a milk, you know. In 1 Peter 2 chapter it says, Desire the sincere milk of the word like newborn babes. That's the Bible we grew up on. How can it change? How can you have verses missing? How can you have words missing? And say, no, well, this manuscript has more evidence, so we're going to remove that. Somebody added it. Well, go back into the Old Testament, check it. It hasn't been added. It was always there. So I'm going to pass, uh, move on from here. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Okay? We see on McDonald's, you know, a little circle under the name, it calls, it's, there's an R in that, which means registered. Or something called a T. It's called trademark. Or a C, which is called copyrighted. He is giving us the copyrights to his church. He is committing it to us. And faithfully, it has been passed on. Today we are having the luxury to have so many Bibles. One person can have ten Bibles. Once upon a time, one person, one family could have only one book. A whole week, a whole month's salary, they would be able to buy only one book. So the whole church would come and then we, they would have one whole Bible. That's the way it used to be. So we need to stand, folks. It's the word of God that we need to stand under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the word is the Lord and the, Jesus Christ is our head. He's the Lord too. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. If people need to come to know God, it is only through his word. No other way. That's why the word is so important that we don't change it. We just believe it. That's all. There might be some tough places. I'm not saying. I went through the whole thing many times. I still go every day when I'm doing translation. Hebrew, English. And the old Telugu right there. And I look at every, there is no error in this book, folks. If you believe that there is error in this Bible, then our faith, there is a glitch in the faith. It's dangerous to believe that. I'd rather believe that there is no error in, than say, well, there is an error. We need to come up with a new translation. When? When the Lord comes back? No. Look at this. So, 20th verse, I'm going to finish up. We are ambassadors for Christ. So the first thing is, in 18th verse, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The first question is, are you reconciled to God this morning? If you are, are you in the ministry of reconciliation? And then the second thing is, do you have the word in your hands? If you do, then he has committed to us and we need to publish that word. So that's what, if you go into the, our display there, you'll see the Bible that we already translated in New Testament and released in 2003. Please do pray for that ministry. And I'm very much involved in that uh, because uh, churches need the Bible, isn't it? It's on his word, uh, word that we build the churches and we go and preach the gospel. Not my word, not my word. When you elected pres this Obama, President Obama, when you people, of, uh, see, I know everybody says this, you know, I, I wait for that, you know, I wait for that. You know, he'll say, but you did, in a way, you know, indirectly. The majority won and he's out there, up there, you know. Why? Because you believed one word, he brought out change. Yes, he did change for the worse. <laughs> Things did change for the worse, as far as I see. And I, my heart goes out to this wonderful nation because of the leadership, you know. But still, it's the core. The church is the core, you know. This is what keeps this church, sta this nation standing. The prayers that go from here. It's not what goes on in Washington, D.C. It's the prayers that go on from churches like this who keep the faith. And then look at this. We are ambassadors for Christ. Are we an ambassador for Christ this day, for God? Well, we have to be. That's the only reason we are still alive. Otherwise, we don't need to be alive because we are just breathing God's precious air and wasting it, you know. So in India, in the, in the Indian language, they have, you are, the way, you are a way to the earth, they say, in their, their language, you know, the, the way they say it, uh, like a proverb. Your, your life is a waste if we don't live for the Lord. So if anybody is not reconciled, we reconcile to God today. And then we need to get close to the word of God and know that this is the book I stand on. I believe it every word. If you don't, then it's dangerous for your own faith. And then we are ambassadors for Christ. Thank you so much. And may God bless your church, Brother Munson, and may God bless America. Thank you so much.